John, we always go to the top on this podcast, and we're going to the top of the NL West this week with the general manager, Mike Hazen, of the Arizona Diamondbacks. Yeah, one of the best uh, general managers in baseball, I believe. They're uh, on the right track. Uh, They're showing it before I think certainly I thought they would. Give them credit. Uh, be 10 games over and tied with the big bad Dodgers at this point is terrific. And they have great prospects coming. So we'll ask them about Corbin, who's already good, Lawler, Drew Jones, and many others. And uh, looking forward to speaking to Mike. Because we are who we are. We'll also ask him about Madison Bumgarner and the tough NL West. You and I will discuss the Rangers at the top of the AL West. The Marlins uh, surprising in the NL East and the Mets not doing quite so well in the NL East. That's if you stick with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. John, uh, our guest this week is uh, Mike Hazen, the general manager of the Diamondbacks. I think if we were probably saying who's the surprise team of the National League, is it the Pirates, is it the Diamondbacks? Uh, even with $800 million plus spent in free agency the last two off seasons, I would say the Rangers are somewhat of a surprise, if not very much a surprise there. As we're speaking, 39-20, and 20, which is their best record ever after that many games. We've we've certainly spilled a lot of words and ink on the Tampa Bay Rays, and they're right on the Rays' heels now for the best record in the whole sport. Are you surprised, and what do you make of these Rangers? Well, I am a little surprised. Give them credit. They've done a terrific job. You know, they're the one team that's really spent big, and then it's paid off. We'll see about the Padres and the Mets, who we'll talk about later, if that's going to pay off. But right now, it's paying off big time. For the Rangers, it's a lot of money to spend. I mean, it's not New York. It's not L.A. Uh, give Ray Davis, the owner, and credit for going out and spending money. We know he spent $185 million on Jake DeGrom, who's been, you know. He's been Jake DeGrom. Just say right. he's been Jake DeGrom. He's, he's been, been, been gromming the season. Right. I mean, he, he's a cameo player, but he's a great cameo player. Uh, you know, I think they anticipated he was going to only throw 100, 120 innings. I think they'll take that now, and they're just hopeful that he's going to be ready for the playoffs. And, uh, you know, they are going to be in the playoffs. They are really good. Their run differential is historically good. You know, I went out, of course, it's early, and I said uh, Aaron Judge is the MVP. Case closed a couple of days ago. I hope I didn't jinx him and cause any injury for him. But, uh, you know what, if if there's a second place now, it may not be Otani. It may be Marcus Semien. He's been incredible. He's on a hitting streak as we do this. Leads the league in a number of categories. That signing was great. Uh, he's great for a team, too. I mean, he plays every single day, and he kind of demands that of the guys around him. And, uh, you know, I, I think that was a great sign. A lot of people raised their eyebrows. 32 years old, $175 million. Seems like a gamble, but that was a good gamble. Yeah, a very good gamble. I, I'm glad you hit his durability. Uh, year after year, he plays a ton of games, almost all of them every year, besides being an outstanding all-around player. It kind of floats under the radar a little. I think, you know, if you're a casual baseball fan, you might not realize how good a player Simeon is. Well, he's a free agent. As you mentioned, he's, got, you know, he would finish no worse than third right now right. for AL MVP. Nathan Eovaldi was a free agent sign. He might be the Cy Young front runner in the American League right mm-hmm. now right yeah. with guys like Cole and McClanahan right. and their manager is, was a free agent Bruce Bochy I would say that he's probably a guy who's up for manager of the year and their third baseman obviously not a free agent because it's a rookie category Josh Young is probably the front runner for rookie of the year I mean if you start looking all around they in the four major categories they've got a high-end front runner it should be no surprise therefore when you start throwing in what Nate Lowe is doing and Andrew Heaney, a free agent signing, and John Gray, a free agent signing, and Corey Seager, a free agent signing, what they're doing, I, it, in some ways, it's not surprising that they're actually ahead of the Astros. I'd ask the bigger question off of what you've seen. Do you think that the Astros are down enough and the Rangers are up enough that this is how the division ends up? Oh, easily could. I mean, uh, the, the Rangers are really good. Uh, that run differential is shockingly good. And that really tells the tale uh, as well as the one loss record. Obviously, you know, I would say Josh Young is clear front runner for rookie of the year. He was the AL rookie of the month in April and he was the AL rookie of the month in May. So he's a terrific player. 
you know, they've got a lot of po- firepower on that team. Seeger is now back. He missed a long time, and he's now back. That's huge because he's one of the best hitters in the game, um, as he should be with the contract that he got, $325 million. I thought it was interesting that they went for pitchers. And, of course, a lot of pitchers have injury questions now, but they – took a lot of pitchers with injury questions and uh, you know, it's generally paid off. We'll see about DeGrom. Obviously it's early in that deal and he's good when he pitches, but I mean, of all the, I mean, you know, you could quibble and say maybe he's behind McClanahan, but he's certainly right up there. As you mentioned, Um, you know, Heaney's had injury questions in the past. Um, You know, they obviously brought back Martin Perez, who's also been good. Uh, they've made a lot of good decisions, and uh, it's showing right now. So um, give them credit. Uh, you know, normally when you spend a lot of money, it should help, and that's the one team that's really helping. Yeah, you mentioned some of the teams. It, it isn't helping. Uh, you also mentioned run differential. Uh, this is going to be my terrible, tortured uh, segue into the Marlins, who are actually 33-28, and 28, but minus 31 in run differential. News all about the fact they're 16-4. and four. In one run games. Look, they have a guy who's hitting 399 as we speak in Luis Ara- Luis Araz. Uh can they is this sustainable or does the minus 31 tell us a lot more about who the Marlins are? Who, well, by the way, are ahead of the Mets and the Phillies. <laughs> uh yeah, it's pretty shocking. Uh they've obviously got terrific pitching talent, and that helps you win a lot of close games, but 16 and 4 is really special in terms of one run games. I'll say this. They made some good decisions. Uh, I love their manager. Uh, Skip Schumacher is doing a terrific job. He holds the players accountable, uh, which isn't easy for, you know, a relative. I know he's a major league player, relative unknown, at least in the managerial circles coming in. And I give Kim Ang credit there for hiring him because my understanding is that most of her assistants, in fact, a quite a large majority wanted to hire Quattraro and uh, Quattraro now has ended up with the Royals. He was kind of the hot candidate. Of course, he was with the Rays. Every, everything the Rays touch turns to gold. So it was <laughs> kind of the logical guy to go for. And she kind of went for an upset and Schumacher. And I think that was a, a, a very, very good pick. It, you know, it's hard to say with that run differential after I've just praised the Rangers run differential and say how oh, that's going to tell the tale. It's hard for me to say that I expect this team to be a playoff team, but they do have great pitching. Uh, obviously, Yuri Perez is a terrific talent. Uh, when he was called up, some of the scouts questioned whether he would be able to deal with it when he got into trouble. Uh, sometimes in the past, uh, when he got uh, bases loaded or situations that were difficult, um, his pitching would change, would get worse. Uh, he has been he's been good. Uh, they obviously have a terrific <coughs> talent in pitching. You know, I, in the National League, they're clearly a threat. I don't know if they could sustain this at negative 31 and five games over. That's not easy. Yeah, you know, you uh, you mentioned the good pitching. I mean, they're 33 and 28. Sandy Alcantara, the defending Cy Young yeah. Award winner, has yeah. got a 5.07 ERA. They spent money in the offseason on, on uh, Gene Segura. He's got a 34 OPS plus. <clears throat> He's been arguably the worst player in the major leagues. So, you know, I, they're a tough team for me to figure yeah. out. In some ways, every team is going to be looking for power in this marketplace. And I wonder, because Solaire is hitting so well, if the Marlins are really minus 30 run differential team, do they have a piece that they could go out? And look, I don't think they're in the rebuild <laughs> anymore, but add some pieces to try to kind of go for it in a stronger way next season. I mean, they've always been in that kind of area where you've got so much pitching talent and they need hitting. And, uh, you know, obviously we're going to have Mike Hazen on later and they traded a uh, great young pitcher, Zach Gallen to get Jazz Chisholm, you know, Chisholm has been hurt a lot. So, and Gallen is the number one pitcher. So that generally hasn't really worked overall, although Chisholm very talented, you know, they do have pitching pieces. Um, you know, Meyer is hurt. Sixto Sanchez has been chronically hurt, so it's not quite as deep as it was, but uh, they're still going to look to add. They think they're a contender, and I can't blame them. I, I think they're a contender, too, in the National League. Look, right now they're in the playoffs, so, you know, they're going to be a buyer, and, and uh, they're going to be looking for offense. So they're they're going to be different than most teams that are looking for pitching, and that may play in their favor. 
Segway alert, John, you know who's not in the playoffs right now? That would be the 30 and 30 New York Mets, who somehow have a 360 million ish uh, payroll, would owe about another 100 million in luxury tax, and are 500. Just had to me a homestand that defines their season. They looked great for three games against Philadelphia and bad for three games against Toronto, three and three, 30 and 30 as we speak. Are the Mets ever climbing out of this, or are they just bad, good enough and bad enough that this is who they are? You know, I, I have some people tell me that everything went right last year when they won 101 games and they aren't that good. Uh, right now, they're not very good at all. They have a negative run differential, so that 30 and 30 is no fluke. Uh, if you don't make the playoffs of the National League with a $377 million payroll, uh, that would be pretty bad. Uh, you know, I know everyone's picking on Daniel Vogelbach, and I and I wrote about this a little in the last couple Mets columns I wrote in the post the uh, last few days. Uh, you know, their stars need to perform better. Lindor has not been good. I saw somebody picked him as the NL All-Star at shortstop, and maybe he is, and that just shows how weak the uh, class of shortstops is right now in the NL uh Lindor's been very good defensively but they paid him 341 million dollars you can't have a guy hitting 215 for 341 million dollars Starling Marte's hitting a little bit better lately but his on base is like 315 he needs to be on base he can steal at will now with the new rules the big bases and he's not doing it Jeff McNeil you mentioned this he has one extra base hits in his last 31 games this is a guy who won the batting title um you know, those are the players that really need to get going for this team to perform as we expected, or at least close to the way we expected, and to make the playoffs in the National League. Uh, you know, we've been talking about the Mets for a few weeks on this show and, and certainly been concerned a few times, and I'm really concerned right now. You know, John, I agree with you because of this reason. I, I we, we, we lump them, and I think rightfully together to some degree, Mets, Padres, Phillies, uh, they really have juiced up their payrolls. They went top heavy stars. Well, if you're going to go top heavy stars and you're going to have a lot too many situations during the season where the ball's going to be in Dominic Leone's hands uh, in a key moment or in a bat's going to be yeah. in Vogelback's hands, then your stars better really carry you. You know, there better be this moment where, you know, Machado, Tatis, Soto, uh, Bogarts are just carrying you for weeks at a time. And And to your point, John, like, we'll go to the top of the rotation. There's got to be going round and round. Scherzer and Verlander have to be the men. And, you know, like, Senga has to be able to pitch on five days rest. He got $75 million. Lindor has to be better. McNeil has to be better. Like, the the, the team is depth challenge, at least between now and the trade deadline, if Billy Epler can and his group can fix some depth issues. <laughs> Until you do... I understand people want to point out the chorus, you know, to your point, Vogelback or should Vientos be getting at bats or whoever third base. Hey, it's not about the chorus. It's about the stars, the stars, yep. the team yep. is built around stars. And I understand how important depth is in a sport where you bat one to nine, mm -hmm. one to nine, where your rotation goes one to five, where all the bullpen pieces get in. Great. David Robertson's held up his end as a kind of star. Who else has held up their end? Alonzo. That's it. Yeah, I mean, in my column today, I said one guy on the team deserves an honest to goodness, uh, no questions asked, A, and that's Robertson. Uh, Alonzo is on pace for 57 home runs. That's great. Obviously, he's been very good, but he's been slumping lately. So, you know, he's been part of that whole mix. I'm glad you brought up the middle relief. That certainly is an issue. Don't like to make excuses for the $377 million roster, but Obviously, and we knew it at the time, that Diaz injury hurt them. If they had Diaz and Robertson, as we mentioned last week, on the back end and the rest of the bullpen pieces doing what they need to do, Adovino's good and obviously Drew Smith and Rayleigh. But right now you've got four pitchers that you can rely on and Buck's trying to find another one and using Brigham sometimes and he's been okay and using Leon sometimes. I mean, but these are not proven commodities. They clearly will need bullpen at the deadline that that needs to be their priority at least uh, we you know they're, they're going to obviously need to rely on as you said the two future hall of famers and they're not going to be as desperate for starters as some other teams although they may look for a starter bullpen to me is the key and i mean when we're talking about the lineup uh, they just need those guys to do better there is no obvious fix they could bring up mauricio maybe that'll help 
I mean, Cano's doing well right now, so I'm not taking at bats away from him. So I, I mean, it's that's not really an obvious fix at this point. Uh, they're going to need bullpen in a big way, but uh, I, I am concerned about them. Yeah, uh, look, I, I know everyone always wants to bring up the young players, but you're probably best served having one guy introduce one significant player introduced to your lineup a year. The Mets are already at at least two, three, if you include Vientos. Do you really want to make it four with Maurizio? Like, I get it. The answer is always yeah. the backup quarterback. It's always the guy at AAA who's hitting. AAA p- <laughs> pitching, by the way, sucks. Sucks. <laughs> if you're not hitting 300, you're not even trying anymore. So, you know, like I, I would well, ignore some of those stats, but just to – you know, to put a bow on this, uh, uh, John, is like you mentioned the bullpen. And I think that there's a devilish tightrope because he doesn't have because Showalter doesn't have a lot of guys he trusts. He's trying to win games, right? They're only a 500 team like this. You know, if you stay near 500, yeah. you're going to have a shot if you could run something off. On the other hand, Adovino and Robertson are two of the older players in the whole league. And you got to be careful about not burning them out chasing wins in May and June. And then like, you're ready to your point, such a good point, John, you already don't have Diaz. Now, do you really like, what happens if you lose one of these guys? Who's like one of your kind of guys who you trust at the end, it's a big issue. So I I, I do think it's part of this. Well, and they absolutely can't lose Robertson. Uh, He's been indispensable. He had one bad moment. I don't count that against him. I thought that was a mistake by Buck to pitch to Vlad Guerrero. I still will not get that. I, we asked him about it. I didn't really get it. He must know more than we do about it. I, this is Buck Schulter is the guy who walked uh, Barry Bonds with the bases loaded. You have a base empty, Vlad Guerrero. Up. Now, I know he's not having a great year. He's not having that kind of MVP season that we've seen be, in the past. But you've got the pinch runner, uh, Biggio, Kevin Biggio on deck. I, I didn't get that move. But you know, I, I, I get that Buck's under a little heat at this point at 30 and 30. Generally, overall, I don't see this as his fault. They are negative 12 run differential. Uh, They have just underperformed. Uh, I don't believe that's the manager's uh, doing. Um, So I I hear of some heat, at least on Twitter and some other places that are unreliable. But uh, uh, at this point, I do not blame Showalter, but I am concerned about the team. I'm uh, renewing from our very first episode, John. Ignore Twitter. Um, anyway, for a team, for a team uh, we, we were discussing the Mets not doing very well, a team that is doing very well, the Arizona Diamondbacks, they, as we're speaking, they're tied for first place with the Los Angeles Dodgers in the NL West, a half game out of the best record in the whole league behind Atlanta. And we'll talk about that team with their general manager, Mike Hazen, who joins us next on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. Back on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. And uh, we really appreciate uh, Mike Hazen, the general manager of the Tide for First Place Arizona Diamondbacks, as we're uh, doing this podcast. Uh, Mike, thank you for joining us. Uh, I-, I wonder if I could just jump in. You were nice enough. Uh, we spoke for quite a while in spring training when I was in Arizona. And one of the things you said is, I hope my team forces my hands to make us a buyer come July uh, and the trade deadline. Are you there? Do you think you have that kind of team that you're 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 the general manager of right now? Well, <clears throat> certainly to date we do, and and we've played pretty good baseball here for the first couple of months of the season. And you know that, as we all know historically, that's a pretty good marker for uh, what you're going to have to do, hopefully for the rest of the season. And and that's leading into the trade deadline season, which is right now. And you know those conversations are happening. Uh, we are certainly engaging on the buy side. I want to continue to do that. We have needs that we're going to need to shore up with our team, um, but we play hard every single night. I, I don't really see that happening. We're a young team, so I think from a durability standpoint, knock on wood, I hope we can stay relatively healthy as we go through here. And, um, you know, look, after the last few years, what we've been through, uh, we are we are itching at the opportunity to stay in this thing and push it forward and, and make August and September – uh, very meaningful from a baseball standpoint around here. Congratulations on your start, Mike. Uh, it's it's quite an accomplishment uh, after 60 games to be tied for first in that division because that is one of the tougher divisions, certainly at the top with the Dodgers, uh, one of your probably your main rivals. So congratulations. And I want to thank you for coming on the show. I know Ben Charrington is one of your good friends. And uh, I think they were like, I don't know, 
25 and 10 when we had him on and we we cooled him off. I think they lost six games in a row. I don't know if he mentioned that to you after after he was on. So we appreciate your coming on. Uh, and uh, we haven't done that to anybody else, but uh, hopefully we will not do that to you. I want to ask you about your expectations. You're 10 games over now. Uh, are you surprised at all? Well, first of all, I appreciate the qualifier. Yes, uh, you know, I've been holding off some of these uh, interview requests at the uh, yeah, for, so so not to get cooled off uh, externally. <laughs> you do believe in those superstition things. They're real. Um, I is surprised. I'm not surprised that we're playing good baseball and that we're a tough team to play against. I think we saw in the second half of last year, you know, May and June of last year, we we didn't play very well. But August and September, uh, we were so far back, it didn't really matter, but we were causing some problems. You know, we played really good baseball going up through the middle of September last year. And this was the younger group that we had um, when we were doing those things. So to, for us to continue to play this way, it doesn't really surprise me. Um, you know, we've gotten some great contributions up and down our, our roster um, and and really you know all nine hitters I think while we may not scare you from a from an offensive standpoint that we're just going to slug you to death I do think the consistency in our lineup is something that causes some problems we've, we've for, from about May on uh, we've been scoring a decent amount of runs and and that's been enough uh, for us and we had a really good bullpen month too so those two things in combination, I think, um, are what allow us to be in every game almost every single night. And, and as we know, over 162 games, that's what's going to end up putting you in a position to to be there at the end. Uh, Mike, you know, last year, one of your problems was uh, you were in games and your bullpen wasn't very good. You blew a lot of games in the second half of games, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth inning. And you attempted to address this in the offseason, Andrew Chafin. Uh, Miguel Castro, uh, who pitched with the Yankees and Mets uh, recently. Um, Scott McGough. How am I going to pronounce his last name? Mago? Is that the right yeah. name? Yeah. McGough. Uh, they're all pitching well. Uh, you mentioned the trade deadline season is open and the conversations have begun. Where do you think you need to shore up this team? Um, certainly pitching. Uh, you know, we, we've been playing very dramatic baseball lately. We either win it or lose it in the ninth inning. And that's not a great way for a baseball team to go through life. You know, we would like it to be six to nothing in the seventh inning and then just ease on through the last six to out, nine outs of the game. Uh, that has not been happening to us. So we're going to need to address the pitching uh, for sure. I think from a starting depth standpoint, getting through the last four months of the season and or shoring up our bullpen. Um, we play good defense. You know, I, I don't know that our run scoring is going to stay at the clip that it's staying at right now, which me, which is going to put more pressure on our pitching staff. And and I, and I think that's an area that almost every contender will probably have to address, but it's certainly one we're going to need to address. And then trying to figure out some way to add a big bat into the lineup, given that, you know, like I said, one through nine, I think we have a fairly consistent lineup with good hitters. We get on base, we can run, we can do some things. I think adding a little bit of slug would also be in our interest. Not exactly sure where we would fit that in, um, but those are probably the two main areas that we're going to need to address going into the deadline. You know, Mike, just to follow up, uh, it's not your first rodeo. This is your seventh year as general manager of, of the Diamondbacks. You obviously were a top executive with very good Red Sox teams for a long time. As you look from 20,000 feet at this trade deadline, I, I think one of the things that people are noticing is are there going to be enough sellers with enough pieces to help teams like you? Uh, again, we're, we're what, seven, eight weeks away from you really if uh, on this. But what do you think? Is there is there going to be a robust market this year? I don't know. It's a good question. We've talked about it internally. I, I am unsure of that right now. It, it would seem with the two centrals that those divisions, if they don't get away, um, I don't see why all at least four, if not four, you know, in some cases, five of those teams aren't still trying to stay in and go for the division because the division could very well be in reach. And if that's the case, then that's going to take those teams out of the out of a, any selling market, even if they're playing in and around 500. Um, and so that's going to leave, you know, the, the 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 four other divisions. And there's a lot of really good teams in those divisions. I actually think the lack of a robust market could help us rather than hurt us. Um, given that if some of the big boys have trouble adding pieces to their team, because every team is going to need help at the deadline, um, that could leave the playing field a little, a little more even um, and could actually end up benefiting us. 
or or if we can land one of the big pieces away from it and there's a, and, it, and, it, and it's a short market um, that could help us even more so it, it's I would agree that looking at it, I think the competition is, is especially in the national league, at least it's very, very flat environment. Um, even, you know, the teams that aren't where we're standing currently are not that far behind and, and anything is going to, is going to be able to change. So I, I think, I think that's going to, there's going to be a hyper competitiveness around it, but I'm not sure that, yeah, that there's going to be, it's going to be a straight uh, buyer's market. Corbin Carroll uh, seems like a dynamic player, uh, obviously your team doesn't get as much attention as some others. And I think he's probably overlooked a little bit nationally. Um, if you can recall, why did you guys decide to draft him and why did you extend him before he had really done anything? And, uh, is he going to be a star? He looks like he is. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 I think so. I hope so. We, we, we believe he's going to be, but whether he is or not, um, you know, why do we draft him? I mean, we, we, we had been interested in him since the year before. I I've said this before. Our scouts did an amazing job of, of, of getting to know him and covering him. And then we got lucky, you know, for him to drop as far as he did, you know, for, for that many teams to pass on him. I, I don't know why that happened. Um, you know, when you're sitting in the middle of the first round, sometimes that needs to happen for you. You know, you can identify all the best players you want to, but if the draft takes care of it, then then you don't have a shot at taking those players. So that happened for us as well, thankfully. Um, and yeah, he, you know, maybe he's overlooked a little bit. We, we i I hope that we're overlooked a little bit. I think that can be one of our advantages as we go through the season that, you know, teams are looking ahead away from us and, and, and we can still cause problems when we come into town. Uh, but he's a, he's an incredible player. He's got incredible makeup. He is one of the leaders on our team at a very young age. We saw that from the first day that he came into our system and, and that the person, what we were buying into from a person standpoint and ensuring that he was going to be here not through some, you know, I've traded away some really good players for the Arizona Diamondbacks. And I didn't really want to be in a position to do that again with this type of player. Um, you know, I, I regret to some degree doing that in the past. And I didn't want to be in a position to do it again. And, and really, those were the motivations for why we did it. You know, Mike, within this very excellent start for you, these 60 games, you did have to do a tough thing uh, in uh, designating and then ultimately releasing Madison Bumgarner. I wonder if you could take us through the thinking of an organization your size, uh, market size, uh, eating that kind of money and and why you did it. Yeah, it's not great. Um, it, it it certainly is. Uh, it certainly can be prohibitive in what we're trying to get done. And you know, the decisions that we need to make on the free agent market, um, you know, those are those we need to be precise uh, with the decisions that we're making. And and I, I don't know, you know, it, it didn't really work out for us in terms of from a performance standpoint. And that's that's just part of the that's part of the pitfalls of the jobs that we do. And 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 we we need to be better at um, our decision making process and how we're doing those things. But, you know, I, look, I don't regret signing him from a from a human standpoint. It, it was a you know why we were trying to do it, what we were trying to do in terms of building out sort of somewhere into our rotation, that veteran leadership that as we were transitioning to a younger pitching staff, um, that was sort of the intent behind what we were thinking when we did it. But ultimately, it just wasn't working, and we had other guys that we needed to see, and and that was that was the reason why we did what we did when we did it. I'll go with a little happier question on the other end of the spectrum. Zach Gallen, uh, been terrific, a long scoreless streaks two years in a row now. I think you traded it was Chisholm, Jazz Chisholm for him. Tell me what went into that, and how does he do it? Because he is not an exceptionally hard thrower. Looks like he has a great breaking ball, but. People tell me that it's really his approach and uh, his mindset that really uh, leads Gallon to be a star. Yeah, we're we're very fortunate to have a, a number one starting pitcher on our team. I know we used to talk about that. You brought up the Boston days. We talked about that a lot in the Boston days. And having a having a number one starting pitcher every fifth day is is something that I think good teams can really rely on. Um, and he is that, you know. And and yeah, I I think. I think all of what he puts into his job is what makes him so special. He, he is, has elite, he has elite stuff. Uh, yeah. He's not tipping the scales in 97, 98, but his fastball breaking ball change up his cutter, everything that he does plays off of each other. 
and he's the complete he's a complete pitcher um he the way he studies the game the way he works his preparation all of those things not only benefit us every five days but benefit us off the mound too you know mike uh i i think people saw this coming a little bit because you were accumulating good young players like corbin carroll and you had gallon in place and i think there's an anticipation it could extend because of players like Jordan Lola and uh, Andrew Jones' son, Drew Jones. I wonder if you give us an update on, you know, those are high picks for you and important players for your future. Where are they along this process and when what might we see them in the major leagues? Yeah. Um, yeah, we we have another group of players that are coming underneath this this group. And, and again, you asked the question on why extending Corbin Carroll. Part of part extending Corbin Carroll was also to ensure that he was going to play with some of the players that we recently drafted, uh, both being high school kids that um, you know we were hoping to put together as a team at some point and and not wanting to watch Corbin Carroll leave for free agency just as Drew Jones and Jordan Lawler are kind of getting up and getting into their parts of their career. Um, you know Lawler's in double A. Um, he's been he's been pressed a little bit there, you know, kind of struggled a little bit here and there uh, at the beginning, but we pushed him pretty aggressively up through the system. We we want him to uh, experience some challenges um, along the way. I think some of these players, not everybody's going to be like Corbin Carroll, where they just come up through the minor league system, get to the big leagues, and to, at least to this point, never really struggle. That's that's a bit abnormal for me. Um, and and for, for and for this game, you know, having been around young Dustin Pedroia, Mookie Betts, like. Those guys still struggled a little bit even at the beginning. So the Corbin Carroll thing is a little is a little abnormal. Um, but watching these guys go through a little of those challenges in the minor leagues is important. And then Drew Jones has been a little banged up with a quad injury. He's coming back soon. Um, and he will go back to 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 a ball to get restarted up here in the next couple of weeks. But we have another group of young players that are coming up through our system, getting to the upper levels. And you know, we're excited to put all them to all those players together. Joe referenced this, and you alluded to it as well. It might be a tough trade deadline with all those central teams really still in it. Uh, where do things stand with your AAA group? Do you have some reinforcements coming there? Do you feel good about some of the guys that you could call up to help this team? I think so. I, I, I think we probably have more you know, plug-and-play guys getting ready to help us on the pitching staff than we may have on the, on the position player side of things, but we do have some good position players coming too. I think that there's going to be uh, – I think we're going to have the opportunity to have a, a, a good a group of players to ensure that our floor at the major league level stays somewhat consistent if we were to take on injury. I think for us to push forward into that tier of teams that is going to go for the playoffs and potentially win in the playoffs – we're we're going to need to we're going to need to add some firepower externally, and I think that's what we're probably going to be focused on going into the deadline. You know, Mike, when you talk about uh, you know your floor and ceiling, it's in comparison to your division. I think the anticipation was the Dodgers might take a little step backwards this year because they were going to try to break in some young players, and they didn't go kind of hog hog wild in the off season. They're obviously very good again, tied with you. I think people are very surprised about what's going on with the Padres because they brought in such heavy uh, uh, duty star power, the Giants. I wonder if you could assess your division, which you have to kind of survive and thrive in. Yeah, uh, nothing much has really changed over the last six, five to six years for us. Um, the Dodgers are the Dodgers. They're, I, I don't know if anyone, you know, I understand sort of the offseason assessment and breaking down what they did relative to years past. Um, if you watch what they do from a player development standpoint, none of this should surprise you. Uh, their team may be better than the teams that they've had in the past in the sense that they're getting a little bit younger. And, you know, in, in historically, sometimes, you know, from a, with a younger team standpoint, the energy I think that you can maintain through August and September could be stronger. There could be a better durability to their club. So we're going to have our work cut out for us to, to stay up with them. And the Padres are just, I think, <laughs> You know, people shouldn't sleep on that team. That team, once the once the engine gets running there, we're going to have our hands full there, too. And then, you know, the Giants and Rockies are, are are just as competitive all with us, I think, all the time. It's it's going to take a lot of really good baseball for us to to thrive in this division. Um, not to mention we have some of the most aggressive front offices in terms of making trades in this division. So. I can't imagine anyone's going to be sitting still come trading deadline season. And, and I would only imagine those teams are going to get better. 
Well, you're right about them being aggressive. They're also a lot richer than your team is, um, you know, so they, they're able to do that. Um, what about your manager? You keep extending him. He just got extended again uh, on another one-year basis. Uh, does that work for you? And how do you think he's doing, Torrey Lovello? Yeah, I think he's doing a great job. I mean, look at our team and look at the way we play. And I, I don't think there's a – I think, he did. you know, the team takes on the personality of of, of our manager. And he, he stresses a lot of important things that I think the characteristic – that match very well with the characteristics of our team, which is – and, and, and having young players that are comfortable and that play hard every single night has been one of the telltale things that 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 we've been able to bring to the table. And I think that makes us so hard to play against. He does a great job not only being there for the players and supporting them, but also holding them accountable when nobody really sees it. And I think that's been important in terms of the development of our younger players that that they are that they get. It's not just about, you know, being comfortable going out and playing. It's also playing the game the right way. And. He strikes that balance very, very well, and and he and he does a great job of of managing his coaching staff and using his coaching staff, and we have a great coaching staff too, and um, that's all really worked for us. And so we wanted to ensure that the investments that that he that we were making in our players that they were able to make it in the in the manager in return, because I think it's that's important for their growth. I wonder if you could tell us about the uh, big trade of your offseason, because it seems to be working out very well for you. You turned Dal Dalton Varshow. You had uh, excess of lefty hitting outfielders in particular. I, I know the Yankees, for example, were in interested in Varshow. He ended up in the AL East. Probably every AL East team was interested in him. Uh, he ended up with the Blue Jays. You ended up with uh, Gurriel and Moreno, and both are performing at a high level for you. How tough is it to trade someone like Varshow? What is the meaning of those two players for your ball club? Yeah, it was extremely hard. Um, we went through the offseason and we we didn't really have much of an intention of trading him. We knew we were taking big power off of our team. And as as a result, we've seen, you know, we we that that's sort of some of the some of the skill we're looking to add back at the deadline. Um, and he's an elite defender and base runner. And, you know, those were all things that we sort of prided ourselves on being really good at. And so trading him was it took us a long time to sort of wrap our heads around us doing it. But but we but the thing that we kept coming back to and the thing I said in the offseason is we weren't one player away from being a good baseball team or 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 a, um, a playoff caliber baseball team. And so we got two players, two good players and and gave up one. And those two players have really helped us, one, because Gurriel's right handed and he's a really good contact hitter. And we were looking to add some contact into our lineup. And he's obviously exceeded that um, in what he's done in our lineup. And then and then Gabby, we you know, from a catching standpoint, we were thinning out a little bit, quite a bit. Um, and thankfully, we made that trade. Uh, Carson Kelly getting hit by a pitch in spring training and breaking his arm. Obviously, we didn't foresee that. But had we not done that, we would have been in a really tough spot. And and our two young catchers have done a really good job of solidifying behind the plate for our pitchers through these first couple months. And then Carson's coming back here in the next week to 10 days, and it'll be good to get him back. Um, but having both Gabby and 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 Gurriel in our lineup on a daily basis has, has benefited us and really evened us out right versus left which was a major problem for us versus lefties last year. We really struggled, and, and we've, st we've started to even that out a little bit, which has been nice. Mike, uh, as you can probably tell, uh, this is a pretty hardcore uh, baseball show. We ask a lot of nuts and bolts questions, but I'm going to go off the board here a little bit because it's a little different with your personal uh, situation. I want to congratulate you on raising so much money for uh, glioblastoma for those Listening or watching and don't who don't know, uh, Mike lost his lovely wife, uh, Nicole Hazen, last year. I think she was 45. I'm, correct. I'm sorry if I don't have that exact right. right. But last, I believe it was August 4th. And you have four sons. You've got your hat on. Uh, your sons are at Brophy High School in the Phoenix area. So I uh, want to congratulate you, first of all, on raising that money and uh, doing what you do for your sons and for the organization and under the circumstances but i want to ask you you know how are you doing now with uh, you have four children there to raise on your own while well, you have one of the hardest jobs i know people talk about how much money people make who do these jobs but you know it's a 24 hour a day job that you have so how are you doing yeah i appreciate that uh we're doing okay um you know I, I, we, we, you know, every day is different. Um, you know, we miss her so much. 
uh, and, and everything that she did, she ran our house. I know a lot of baseball people can, can really understand that concept of, you know, you, you play second fiddle in your house in the baseball world, um, because you're gone so much and because this job demands so much time. Um, but it, it really is something for us that brings us together, the five of us. I mean, we go to baseball games all the time. They come see me at work and whenever they can. And it, it's something that she loved. She loved the Diamondbacks. Um, she loved watching Merrill Kelly pitch. Um, I'm, it's not surprising that he's having such a great year. You know, I, I think her biggest, his biggest fan is is somewhere watching over. Um, but it, it's it's something that you know from a from what she had to go through was was heartbreaking and horrible to watch. And you know, the reason we're raising all this money is for glioblastoma is there's still no real cure for this disease. It's a it's a terminal brain tumor, brain cancer, and you know, it's it what it does to you neurologically and physically uh, through the treatments, either through the surgeries, it causes so many problems, and the quality of life stinks. Um, as you go through this and, and the median life expectancy is between 14 to 18 months. And, and that stinks. And where we are as a, 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 from a medical standpoint, we should be better than that. We should have better research and we should have better treatment options for these, for these people. And she never wanted somebody else to go through what she went through. And so it's on us, me and the kids to figure out ways to carry on that legacy. And, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. You know, Mike, often I ask the wrap up question, but there's no question after that, uh, after you speak about your wife and what you and your children are doing to carry on uh, as a group and to try to help uh, other people who unfortunately went through what your family went through. And I like even because we do, do appear simulcast on the Yes Network that you were able to explain the red uh, cap, which is your son's uh, cap. So we didn't get any questions on that. And anyway, Mike, thank you so much for opening up on that and opening up on the Arizona Diamondbacks. Continued good luck with your tie for first place club. And we appreciate you joining us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. Anytime, guys. Thanks for having me. We thank Mike Hayes. And of course, he was a terrific guest. We always appreciate people stopping by for 20, 25 minutes with us each week, John. Uh, why don't we close with what we usually close with, hit or error? What do you got this week? I'm going to go error. I'm going to go with the Seattle Mariners. I know I'm known as a Seattle Mariners detractor, and uh, they did make Where the are you play. known as a Seattle Mariners detractor? Is that on the thing I just told you not to, to ignore at all costs? No, everywhere. It's all oh, over. Everywhere. It's beyond <laughs> Twitter. It's it's all over the country at this point. Uh, 29 and 30. I mean, there are a lot of disappointing teams. you got the Cardinals. you got the Padres. you got the Phillies. Of course, we talked about the Mets. Now, the Mariners are pretty disappointing, too, because that 29-30 record is really not a 29-30 record. They have seven wins, 7-0 and against the Oakland A's, which is basically a triple-A team. I know it's the Oakland A's. It should be the Oakland triple-A's. So 22-30 and against regular real teams for the Seattle Mariners when they were supposed to be taking another step forward. That's an error. Yeah, you know, the the possible combined for the four teams in the AL West against uh, the A's this year would be 52-0. and 0. There's already a few wins they have in the division, but they're also, I think, 0-7 against Houston. I wonder how close to those 52 wins the other four teams get and how much it corrupts the whole uh, playoff uh, race this year. My hit, John, is literally going to be a hit. We mentioned it earlier in the first segment of the show. I mean, Luis Arraza is hitting 399, and we're old enough. We remember George Brett chasing it. We've seen some Tony Gwynn. There was a year John Olerud. You and I were on the uh, the beat and covering uh, Paul O'Neill in the short year. He kind of made a little run, especially about this time of year. I think he was still up over 400. Yep. And I appreciate <clears throat> that even with uh, liberal rules, with no shifts, et cetera, but guys feel better than ever before. Pitching is is kind of more devilish than ever before. To be able to be hitting 399 two plus months into the season, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, you know what? You've been the hit guy and I've been the, the error guy lately. And I'm going to add another error here. It's on us because we knocked that trade for a ride. I did. For I did for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say we did. And I didn't uh, disagree. I, I thought that the Twins got the better of it getting a viable to good starting pitcher in Lopez and getting a very good prospect in Salas. I mean, Arise, if he hits 400, we're going to have to do a, a big mea culpa, bigger than the one we did over the Angels last year, I think. <laughs> 
Yeah, just the other way because somebody actually performs too well. Uh, but you know that that would mean you're going to have to stick with us on the show uh, with Joel Sherman and John Heyman, a podcast from the New York Post. Thank you to our producers as always, Jake Brown and Andrew Hart for navigating us through this. Don't forget every Wednesday this uh, podcast drops on the Yes uh, um, app. Uh, give us a view. Don't forget uh, to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen to the podcast. Please give us a five-star rating. Keep us in business. Keep the lights on, all that. And please stick with us all season on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman.